joy of baptism this morning. And the first service, Eric and Carla were baptized, husband and wife, and their kids were all in the front row, young kids just watching them. And they shared their stories of how their parents taught them about Jesus. And Eric's, both mom and dad, just went to be with the Lord recently. So it was moving as he's thinking about his father and his heavenly father and his mother in heaven and the joy uh, that they had in baptism and their kids seeing that in the legacy. And it's a reminder that God invites all of us from every age, every generation, every nation, invites us to himself and this relationship with Jesus. We are focused on Jesus. That's our church. Uh, welcome if you're new. So glad you're here. If you're interested in baptism, let us know because truly, uh, every follower of Jesus, it is a step where you take, a significant step, a memorable step where you glorify the Lord and it sets the tone for your walk with God as well. Uh, we're in a series right now called Empowered. We're in the book of 2 Timothy. We love to go through the Bible and all our different classes and life groups and here as we gather. If you have a Bible, uh, you can open it up. 2 Timothy, it's in the New Testament. It's a letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. Timothy is being mentored by Paul and you can find it on your phone. If you ever need a Bible, let us know. Today we're gonna look at soldiers, athletes, and farmers. Just a couple of verses, and God loves everyday people. Amen? Aren't you glad that God loves everyday people and soldiers, athletes, and farmers? We're gonna rethink some things together today. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your grace in our lives. Jesus, thank you for your kindness. Thank you that you're real, that you're good, that you're faithful. And God, thank you how you hear our prayers. You know our hearts, you know where there's pain, you know where there's uncertainty and stress. Thank you for carrying our burdens. Thank you for healing today. And thank you for opening our eyes and our minds to your vision, your truth, and our hearts to your love. And we give you glory together. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. As you open up the Bible and read the Bible, you're gonna notice the ordinary and the extraordinary. You're gonna notice the natural and the supernatural. It's a both and. God works in the ordinary, God works in the extraordinary. You're also gonna see literal and metaphorical. And God is in both. Simplicity and complexity, God moves through both. You might have a favorite, you might prefer complexity, but God works with complexity and simplicity. You might per prefer simplicity, but I'll tell you, this is a complex world, and theologically there's many complex things. We highlight these in this range in the spectrum because God is working and communicating in all these ways to us. And as we open up God's word, that's what the Bible is, 66 books, God communicating to you, God's wisdom, God's heart, we're listening to God, his thoughts are above ours. And we see as we're going through 2 Timothy, in chapter one, there's the complexity and the wow and the how does this work of chapter one, verse nine. God has saved us called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And you take that in, there's so much to unpack. The gospel, before the beginning of time, God's grace, Jesus defeats death. There's a lot there theologically. And we're in awe of who Jesus is and what he does. And then today's passage that we're focusing on in 2 Timothy chapter two, starting in verse three, it's much more direct, practical. There's a simplicity to it. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Paul was continually learning, Timothy continually learning. Let's be lifelong learners. Don't hit a point in your walk with God where you think, well, I pretty much know it all, I'm doing it all, there just isn't a lot of growth left. No, we don't wanna hit that plateau. And Paul's moving forward, pressing on towards the goal. Timothy, there's a lot here for you to learn. Now notice that he's talking to Timothy, who at that time was a pastor in Ephesus. He's saying, pastor, you need to learn from the soldiers. Pastor, you need to learn from the athletes. Pastor, you need to learn from the farmers. 
Now, we usually flip it the other way. We usually say soldiers, athletes, farmers, come learn from pastors, and you know that can be part of it. But notice here, pastors, learn from everyday people because they're inspiring. They will teach you so much. So look beyond the four walls of the church. Notice how they're living for God, and let's dive into this. Starting with soldiers, I'm gonna read verse three again. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. With soldiers, we see a fellowship of faithfulness. The dedication, the diligence, and the faithfulness of soldiers should move us. I am so grateful for everyone who served our country and continues to serve in our military to protect us. Amen? Can we give it up for those people who are in the room who are serving our country right now? I have a picture at my desk. It's my grandfather. He fought in World War II. He was jumping out of airplanes, risking his life, the Battle of the Bulge. He was courageous, and I keep that on my desk because I'm inspired by my grandpa's example. You probably have some people in your life who have or are serving our nation, and because of their dedication, we have the freedoms that we have. And what can we learn from that fellowship of faithfulness? Well, fellowship means participation, and it means sharing together. Soldiers know that when they say yes, there is suffering, sacrifice, there's going to be a lot of serving involved. Show me a soldier that hasn't served, sacrificed, or suffered. It doesn't exist. And if anyone wants to follow Jesus, similarly, there's going to be serving, sacrifice, submission. There's going to be suffering involved. And Paul's telling that to Timothy because it's a reality in Paul's life. He's going to become a martyr shortly after he writes this letter. And this fellowship, endure hardship with me, it literally means suffer hardship with me. Be willing to take it and endure. Be willing to take it. What soldier says, you know, uh, I'm just not feeling it today. I just don't want to make my bed today. I just don't think I'm going to put on camo today. You know, it's raining today. I just don't feel like doing it today. I don't feel like protecting everyone today. It's not a, well, do I feel like it? We live in a culture of, well, do I feel like it? Do I feel like it? I don't know. Do I feel like glorifying, following, serving Jesus? I don't know. Do you feel like it? Yeah, you don't feel like it. I don't feel like it today either. And he says, think about the soldiers. Think about the cost. Think about our Savior. John chapter 15 In verses 18 to 20, before Jesus' death and then his resurrection and ascension, in John chapter 15, we read, as he's sharing his heart with them, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you? A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. It's a reality check so that they wouldn't be discouraged or surprised. What Jesus is saying is if you go all out for me, there's gonna be some persecution. It's coming. And you know what, Timothy? Be ready and be willing to take it when it comes because it will come. It does come. Jesus uh, communicates in a language where people understand and they get it. God communicates here about soldiers and people in that time knew the reality, they knew the tone, they knew the cost, they understood the world, and when they say soldiers, those images come to mind. Now, what can we say when we think about how Jesus communicated? You know, it was oftentimes direct, clear, practical, simple, in a sense. He called everyday people who were fishermen And what did he tell them? You've been fishing for fish, now you're gonna fish for people. That's language they can understand, right? You've been fishing for fish, now you're gonna fish for people. What does Jesus say in terms of the greatest commandment? Love your neighbor. (laughs) That's pretty direct, practical, isn't it? Well, who's my neighbor? Well, where do you live, work, learn, and play? (laughs) Those people around you, that's your neighbor. So love your neighbor. Make disciples. What do you do? You help people take the next step in their walk with God. Go to all the nations, go everywhere and share the good news so that every man, woman, and child has a chance to follow Jesus. 
Jesus is very direct, clear, practical. Now, some people say, well, that's just too simple. I've heard that before. I want something kind of in a fresh way that tickles my ears, maybe something, a little twist on it. I can't go above love God with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. I can't go beyond share the gospel with every man, woman, and child. I mean, that's just as direct, it's clear. We need God's power to do it. But there it is. We're either gonna do it and want it or not. But it's clear. In this passage about soldiers, there's a clarity to it. What do we, how are we inspired by soldiers? First of all, they're single-minded. They have an undivided heart. They have a loyalty. If your hand is at the plow, don't look back. Right? There's not a lot of complaining and, and shrinking back. Instead, they know they've been called and it's an honor to serve. Also, they avoid civilian affairs. They're gonna say no to things that are lesser than their calling, distractions, worldly stuff, saying no. <clears throat> if you're following Jesus, there should be a list of things you're firmly saying no to. No thank you, that's not for me. There should also be another list where you're like, you know, I don't have to have that. The world is chasing after all that, but I don't have to chase after all that the way the world does. There's another list there where you're like, you know, that's not wrong, but it's just not for me. Binge watching all weekend is not wrong, but I've just done that before and I know where my faith is and my fire is at the end of the week and it just, I don't want it to diminish right now. So I'm not gonna dive into that, it's not wrong. Have fun with it. If you're, if you're going for it, great, if that works for you. But for me, it's just not gonna help me in my walk with God. See, we've gotta be discerning and a, a soldier knows, okay, that's not for me. That doesn't have my name on it. That's gonna hold me back from the calling. I don't wanna slow down. I don't wanna shrink back. There's too much on the line. This is too important and I'm going for it. That's a soldier's mindset. And also a soldier knows how to follow the leader. Pleasing your commander. What I'm not saying today is that you can earn God's love through performance. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying today you can earn a spot in heaven by doing good things or enduring enough hard things that then God will love you. I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying today is that we have a goal, and our goal is to honor and glorify Jesus. And there's nothing better in your life, more than the paycheck, than the applause, than the respect from other people. There's nothing greater in your life, and for our church, there's nothing greater then what we do and how we treat each other and listen to each other and love each other, how we glorify Jesus beyond the walls of this church, that Jesus is pleased, that God smiles, that he is happy and we are faithful. There's no greater calling. And is there a cost? It's pretty big cost. But what else is gonna bring us more joy than the Lord rejoicing over us? Because in a culture that's so often going sideways, we're trusting and living for God. Soldiers, endurance in Christ Jesus. And you can tell Paul, I mean, he's sharing this with Timothy. Timothy's taking this in. There's a lot to learn from soldiers. Timothy's in a kind of a spiritual battle. This is not an easy place. There's a lot of pushback. There's some nasty comments. There's some people looking down upon him. And this helps him to keep going. And then the next one's athletes. And in verse five, there's probably a lot of people in this room who play sports, have played sports. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. Athletes have a vision for victory. Any athlete has a sense of victory and chasing, going after that victory and a vision for victory. It involves training, rules, and trophies. The Olympics have been around for a long time. Way back, they had to swear that they would train hard for 10 months. If you're gonna be in the Olympics, you had to agree, give us your word, you're gonna train hard for 10 months. Now, our cults are so sports-minded that we're like, 10 months of training, like who doesn't do that? Like Olympians, four years of training, and they started when they were two years old now, you know, with mom and dad saying, make the Olympics, make the Olympics, and there's more pressure on young athletes than ever before. Like, our culture knows about dedication with athletes. Well, you gotta play within the rules, the boundaries, the standards. Every sport has that in soccer, yellow card, red card. Every sport has that. If you're going to have the victory, you've got to honor the guidelines. And why would you go after it? Because there's a prize. There's a prize. 
There's so much in the Bible about sports. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is one of those chapters that highlights it in verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run, and this is a metaphor of your life, run in such a way as to get the prize. You say, well, what's the prize? For a lot of athletes, it is money, it is fame, it is adoration. Maybe it's even a gold medal or a ring. But there's a higher prize. There's a greater prize, Paul is saying. And the prize is transform lives. It's transform lives. And that's the prize that you run after. The World Cup is is coming up next month. And there's an estimated audience of 5 billion people going to watch the World Cup. Now, in this room, maybe it's a smaller percentage. But worldwide, soccer is the number one sport. That event kind of makes the Super Bowl look like minor league. I mean, just saying it objectively, no bias there whatsoever. Uh, soccer's kind of close to my heart. But uh, the reason, you know, when you think about the platform of soccer, that's why we're making content right now to send out around the world during the World Cup talking about Jesus. Because faith in sports, you can bring the two together. And when there's watching, athletes have an incredible platform. You see, there's a greater prize in its transformed lives. This clear victory It's worth it. The Bible keeps saying it's worth it. It's worth it. Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. God has a race marked out for all of us. So let's run that race. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's where he is today. Consider him, Jesus, who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and you will not lose heart. You know, uh, when I was playing soccer and I was a goalkeeper, a couple things that were there, it was like the exercise and eating right. So soccer was an idol in my life. Then I came to know Jesus And then soccer is still a big part of my life. And when I started to follow the Lord, I thought, okay, if I'm going to exercise and eat right for soccer, then it only makes sense that I'll, Lord willing, stay in shape and eat healthy as I'm following Jesus. Because if I did it for soccer, a simple thing like that, I want to do it for Jesus. Now, he determines the number of days of my life, but I want to have all the energy I can have every day to serve the Lord. And I want to do it as long as I can. And if those things helped in soccer, I think they're going to help in ministry. You see, I just couldn't figure out when I came to know the Lord, if I can be in a locker room that's united with people from different cultures and nations and we feel so close, how can I step into a church and there's so much division and even racism in the church? I just didn't get that. I didn't get it how I can go for soccer at 95, 98, 90%. And how could I just show up and give Jesus 52%? How could I go 54%, 48%? I just didn't understand how there could be so much passion for sports and so mild and casual and halfway for Jesus. It just wasn't computing for me because I came from that athletic background. If I would talk about soccer all the time, then how would I step into the Christian circles and just, oh, nobody here talks about Jesus? Well, I'm just not going to talk about Jesus too then. You see, if I'm talking about soccer all the time, it just naturally flows. I'm going to be talking about what I love and I'm passionate about all the time, and that's Jesus. And so if you're coming from a military background or a sports background, you just kind of, some of these concepts... You're just like, I'm going for it with the Lord. And Paul's saying to Timothy, think about this, how you're living, how you're leading, how you're loving people. Because, you know, that vision for victory, what is it in your life? What's that lane, that race that God has called you to run? What is that victory? I know in my life, I want to see marriages strengthened. And sometimes the pain, again, fuels and forges the purpose and the passion because I watch my parents get divorced. And I don't want couples to have to go through that. I I so much want every child to have a forever family. Uh, Adoption is close to my heart. Uh, I I so much want everyone to be able to hear about Jesus and be invited into a relationship with him because no one told me ever growing up 
until college. I didn't know any Christians. No Christians ever befriended me or shared their faith with me. I so much want people to discover this word and go in deep because nothing's nourished my soul uh, like time in this word and God speaking. So, so I have some things in this vision of victory that I'm running after. You have some things in your story, in your life, in your gifting, in your calling that you are running after. And like an athlete, you go for that thing and press on to the mark for the glory of God. It's all for the glory of God. It really is. And in the Lord's strength. We don't do it on our own strength. But God supernaturally empowers you when you say yes to him. And on the other side of yes, there's transformed lives, which are the greatest prize. And it leads to farmers. And in verse 6, the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Farmers have the hope of harvesting. They know about the harvest. In Psalm 126, it says, we sow in tears, but we reap with joy. In the harvest, there's hard work. There's faith involved. There's reliance on God. But there's a contrast between hard work and laziness. You know what it is with laziness? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, and scarcity comes on you like a bandit. Have you ever noticed if you're lazy a little bit, it's real easy to be lazy a little bit more? Have you ever noticed that if you start to say yes to lazy, pretty soon it kind of becomes a little bit of the lifestyle and it kind of becomes normal? And then you don't really want to hang out with hard workers because you kind of want to find some other people who are just kind of okay with lazy too. And so you gather them around and you don't call it the fellowship of laziness, but instead you just kind of gather around and say, yeah, that's enough, that's good enough. Oh yeah, don't sweat that, don't work too hard on that. And pretty soon it becomes hard to do hard work because when you're lazy, work just looks extra hard. And so the book of Proverbs talks about this, and it's, again, a contrast, hard work and laziness. I'm from the Midwest where there's a strong work ethic. Uh, I'll, I'll acknowledge that. But look what the book of Proverbs says. God declares this in chapter 6, verse 6. Go to the ant, you sluggard, and consider its ways and be wise. Learn from the ant. Proverbs 10, 5. He who gathers crops in summer is a prudent son. But he who sleeps during a harvest is a disgraceful son. Don't miss the harvest. Proverbs 13, 4. A sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. Proverbs 14, 23. All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Laziness and mere talk. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 4. Sluggards do not plow in season, So at the harvest time, they look, but they find nothing at the harvest. And then also Proverbs 26, 15, a slugger buries his hand in the dish. He is too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. I think that's some Bible humor, if I'm discerning correctly right there. Get the hand in the dish, but it'd be so much work to to bring it up to my mouth, so I'm just not going to do it. The, The farmer is hardworking for some crops. Then how much more? for some transformed lives, for some people, for some souls, for eternity, how much more? You say, where's the harvest? The harvest is in going the extra mile. That's where the harvest is. It's in going the extra mile and doing it again and again. The harvest is in doing consistently what most people only do occasionally. The harvest is there. The harvest is in generosity with your time, with your listening, with your compassion, the harvest is in generosity. The harvest is in planting a lot of seeds. Whoever shares the word and shares the gospel, more seeds, more harvest. Less seeds, less harvest. I'm trying to make it clear what the harvest is. The harvest is in the relationship risk. The person who always retreats and wants to play it safe all the time, the harvest isn't there. Jesus is relationship risk after relationship risk after relationship risk after reputation risk. That's where the harvest is. The harvest isn't going to come to you in your cute little setup and say, yeah, I'm just going to chill and give me a big harvest. It won't come to you. It's the law of the harvest. Whoever sows much, reaps much. It's harvest time. It is harvest time today, not just for crops, but for people. 
So live wisely, learn from the farmer. And again, the soldier, the athlete, the farmer. And then, you know, here's the meditation. Here's the deeper thinking. Verse seven, our last verse, reflect on what I'm saying for the Lord will give you insight into all this. When you read the word, take some time. Have some silence. Think, go deeper, reflect, talk about it, meditate on it. Memorize some of these verses that are gonna inspire you. And the Lord's gonna reveal, because when you spend time in the word, the Holy Spirit enlightens and opens up truth and insights to you. And you come humbly and hungry to God's word. God communicates and God empowers. So what are those practical, applicational pieces here? I'm gonna highlight three as we wrap up. The first one, tear down sacred and secular divisions and rankings. Tear them down. Now, you can say amen if that's your tradition, or you can just say tear it down, tear it down, because I'm gonna name a few paradigms that need to be torn down. The first one is this. Those who go out as missionaries are the A team, and the rest of us are the B team. Now, what's the danger there? Why would we wanna tear that down? You know why we wanna tear that down? Because otherwise, we're gonna see one group as super spiritual, and the rest of us is not that important. We're gonna kick back in our comfy chairs thinking they've got it covered around reaching the whole world, and then we're not gonna be that passionate or involved or participate in what God's doing around the world. The truth is we're all world Christians. The truth is we're all sent ones. That's what a missionary means. And so all of us pray, all of us welcome people from other nations, all of us open up our homes, all of us give and send and all of us mobilize and all of us look at what God's doing around the world and get involved. Do you see how that needs to get torn down that there's just one little group and they're super awesome and the rest of us really can't make a big difference in the world? (laughs) We'll just be passive. So we tear that down. Here's another one in terms of rankings. And this one doesn't get verbalized, but I'm, I'm gonna just describe it right here. Uh, top spot, okay, if you're here in America and you serve at a church, all right, you're spiritually, you're at the top spot. Second spot is if you're parachurch. You know, it's Christian, it's not quite the church, it's World Vision, it's Young Life, but that's, okay, we'll give you that second spot. Third spot, nonprofit, okay, because it's noble, you're still doing some really good things. And then fourth spot, oh, for profit, there's money involved, so it's not as spiritual as the lie, and so you're kind of there. And then just below that down there, well, you actually don't work and you, you stay at home, and you're just kind of like investing your life in, into the, the kids. Like that's, because I mean, you don't get any applause, any paychecks, so you're, you're kind of down there. Do you see the junk on that ranking? Do you see the nonsense on that ranking? That's thinking like the world, not like God. Are you kidding me? The person who's home and pouring their lives and helping those young kids in the ways of the Lord, you're gonna tell me they're less important than someone who works for a parachurch? No, you're not. I say tear that thing down. Tear it down. Don't let who you are is not what you do. And don't let the applause or lack of the applause and the paychecks Let it define you and your calling or the significance of your calling. Here's another one. Uh, You know, this is what we do. We ask people, what do you do? And they say their job, right? And so we start to rank that. Okay, that job. Sometimes your parents will rank your job. Well, what do you do? What do you want to do? And your parents are going, oh. (laughs) Well, what's your title? And how many degrees do you have? complex ranking systems on this stuff, I'm telling you. And, and pretty soon, there's a matching respect level. Oh, you achieved this profession. Oh, that's your income. Oh, well then respect is here. What, you're only doing that for your job? And then, oh, let me bring down my respect down to there. You might have a, a cruel version of that, even in your family. But I'll tell you, that's not coming from God. When you share your location of where you work, when you share the name of your company, there's some companies in the sound that everyone knows around the nation. They're like, whoa, you work for them? And then there's others who are gonna say, well, I'm just doing this little, it's kind of a mom and pa shop, it's a startup, I'm not sure it's gonna work. Oh, that's all you're doing? Okay, really, really? This is our building, whoo, it's downtown Seattle. Look how tall, amazing it is. Well, I'm just trying to work from home because I can't afford an office. Oh, you're in that position right there. 
You see, so we rank how impressive that stuff looks, and it's not from God. It's not from God. Here's another one. Well, how much do you give to the church? You know what the book of James says? Don't show favoritism. Sometimes people think, I know how much everyone gives. I don't know how much anyone gives, and I don't care. I don't want to know. I don't want to be thinking, oh, this is a big donor. I better give him my time and attention and be extra nice. Oh, I don't think that one gives too much. Yeah, I got time for other people. I don't want that business. I just want to love everybody. I don't want to do the favoritism thing. I don't want to be sitting around in committee meetings going, okay, we know who our five biggest donors are. Oh, they don't like it that we're getting a little bolder in the community. If we're getting bolder on the weekend, they're going to leave the church because they want to keep it real kind of spiritual temperature, kind of mild. We're getting a little excited for Jesus. You know what? We can't lose our top five donors. Let's just tone it all down. Let's just, let's just make it real palatable. Let's not talk about sin so we can keep our big donors. I don't want that junk. I don't want that junk. I'm just trying to name some of the religious junk that happens. Here's just one more. Sunday, living by faith. The other six days, yeah, I'm just turning my faith down quite a bit. Sundays, on fire for Jesus. Six days, kind of sleepy with my faith. Sunday, bold for the Lord, talking about what he's done in my life, celebrating that. Other six days, kind of silent, afraid of the people I work with. Uh, What is God trying to help us do? Break free from the religious traps, paradigms, and mindsets that don't come from him. And when we talk about soldiers, athletes, and farmers, he's starting to paint a picture. What's the picture? It's consistency in how they serve and who they are throughout the week. It's equality. Because soldiers, athletes, farmers, there's not one above. There's not a ranking. Pastors, learn from them. Learn from them. And then also there's a legitimacy to your role. Whether you're cleaning houses, you're an administrator, whether you're a teacher, whatever your role is, there is a legitimacy and a calling to that role. So don't let the person next to you think you're big stuff if you've got a big position and you landed a promotion and you're CEO, but you're little stuff if you're just one of 10 people that report to someone who reports to someone who reports to someone. Just get rid of that junk and instead walk with God, glorify Jesus. You know, the next one is that you realize that your work is your window. Say that out loud. Your work is your window. One more time. Your work is your window. Three pictures, three windows. The first one, you look at this window and you think, yeah, okay. You're probably just gonna keep walking, right? You're not gonna go over there. You're not gonna look at it too long. It's not that, yeah, I think I'll just keep going. Nothing for there for me to really look at. And sometimes there's windows that are kind of like that and not even really seeing much of what's inside. Here's a second window. This window's a little different. You might look a little longer because you might think, wow, that window is... Well done, it's, uh, the color's nice, the look is sharp, uh, it's a nice looking window. But notice, you can't really see what's behind that window. There's a lot of people in the room who people look at you and they say, yeah, you're organized, you kind of you know, do things well, and you're super nice, so, uh, but they don't know anything deeper about you, they don't know your story, there's not a depth in relationship, they don't know about the God who's empowering you. You just kind of look nice and you're getting all the glory because they just say, oh, nice guy, nice lady. Well, there's a third window and look at that window right there. Now, I know it's only been raining for a couple days, but I think I'm ready for that window right there because I can see beyond the window and it's like, yes, please, could you tell me about how you have that peace? Could you tell me where that peace comes from? Can you tell me about the hope that you have? Can you tell me about the joy that's greater than our circumstances? Because I see something in you that kind of looks like Jesus and kind of sounds like Jesus. And I'm just, I'm kind of curious about Jesus. You are a window. And people, some of them in the sound, not too many during the week, they read the Bible. But everyone in the sound is reading you. And you're a window. And that's not pressure. It's an incredible honor and a privilege to where you say, God, come into my life. Because that amazing window, it's not about the person. I've messed up. 
I made bad decisions. I've blown it. I'm honest. It's not me, but there is a God of hope who picks me up and he's a lifter of my head and he will help you too. Everything he's given to me is available to you. If he did it for me, he can do it for you. That's the story of my window. That's it right there. And so know that you're a window. Say no to gossip. Say no to uh, slander. So common, complaining, gossiping, slander. It's just so common. Say no to that stuff. Say no if it doesn't have integrity. And say yes to caring about your coworkers, getting to know their name and their story. Say yes to going beyond your job description. Say yes to doing a great job when no one's looking and there's no pats on the back. Say yes to getting there early and showing up with a good attitude. Say yes to those things because those are a window where people sees, they see God. And you say, well, my working environment's different than other people. It's spiritually, it's so dark. Then I would say, shine the light brighter. Shine the light brighter. And if they say, well, there's so much that's wrong that's going on, then I would say, redeem more with the love and the truth of Jesus. Because the questions are, did God send you there? And has God released you? If God didn't lead you there, you don't wanna be hanging out there. But if God led you there, then you're there with a great purpose. And you say, well, I feel like leaving, it's not easy. Well, if God releases you, then leave. But if he didn't release you, he's gonna give you everything you need to shine his light and love in that place. And again, it comes back. Let's glorify the Lord. God knows where to place his windows and where to put them in different seasons so that people experience him through you. He empowers you. And the last one is bring what honors God into the church. Into the church. You know, I stopped at 10 here, but I am so inspired by your talents, gifts, and passion and how you bring that with vision and creativity into the church. We had a staff meeting Tuesday and there was someone who's not on staff that was sharing about numbers, systems, accuracy, and it was so helpful. And this person also built an entrance when you walk in the West Entry. Some of you walk right through it. Why? Because there was vision and need. And this person brought their gifts, serving the staff. There's another person in our church who does branding for the Mariners and the Dodgers. And going through this series, he designed Empowered. And then the creativity to say, well, what if we put on T-shirts and hats? Well, why would we do that? There's no profit there. But you know what? Some people, they can wear that, and that's going to lead to some conversations. It's going to be a talking point. Well, what does empowered mean? Well, actually, God empowers us. How do you live without fear but with power and love? Well, God helps you do that. So these designs can lead to conversations and invitations. And so that's what's happening. Um, we have people in law enforcement that work security, worked in pri prisons, jails, and they come and they protect, they're on the security team. They lead the security team. Because they're like, you know what I'm doing in the community? I think I wanna do it in church. We have people who help think through vision and next steps in shaping it, and I'm so grateful. They're not part of our staff, but again, they're using their gift that God has given them. We have people with legal experience and insights that are a go-to in different situations that happen when we need to have that consideration, and they offer so much wisdom. There are people in our church who speak multiple languages and they welcome and connect with people from many different nations. We are so thrilled to be a church of all nations. God said my house will be a house of all nations. I talked to someone uh, after the first service who said I took French 40 years ago and I was in a place this week where no one spoke French and it was the only language the person spoke. And I shared my broken French and I was surprised, you know, God helped me. We were able to talk in that conversation in French. That person just felt so loved and so connected. I can't believe the difference that it made. Uh, so again, uh, IT security, that's a real thing. We've had, you know, people from our church serving in that area with their gifts. Social media strategy, algorithms, helping us, because why? We're reaching people digitally. We want to know the best practices. We have people who know websites and apps that are helping, that are volunteering and building that up. Uh, the flooring that you walked on in the lobby, 
It was someone in our church, that's their profession, and they said there was a need here and helped us in many ways, including laying that flooring. It's the same one downstairs. It's just bringing my gift into the church setting. Leadership development. Again, I could go on and on. Don't think that just because you have a talent that it has to fit in one little tidy slot. Instead, what is God doing in you and through you? And that's what we do together here and beyond the four walls of the church. I'll conclude by saying this, God empowers you beyond what you could think or imagine. God goes ahead of you. And on that race that you're running, he already places in that road good things for you to run with him and run for him. The vision is all people in all places. That's the biblical heartbeat and vision for God is that all his people going into all places, abiding with Jesus and bearing fruit. Why would we shrink that vision into a few people, some people, a couple places? We don't wanna shrink God's vision for our lives. Say, is there a cost? Yes. Are you uncomfortable sometimes? Yes. Is it new? Yes. But can we say yes to Jesus today as we're inspired by farmers, athletes, and soldiers? Can we say yes to letting him empower us? In doing that together, it'll be his strength, all people, in all places. At the end of this time, uh, we give an invitation. One way that you can respond is by texting the church phone number. We've seen a lot of people recently come to know Jesus. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship yet, this is not rules, religion, and rituals. This is not something earned. It's grace, an undeserved gift. And it's because Jesus died for your sins and he's risen. And today you can start an eternal relationship with Jesus. Know that your sins are all forgiven. You're going to heaven and you have peace with God. You can make that decision just like you decided to sit on that chair and trust that chair today. Well, you're putting your trust faith in Jesus. God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. You can make that decision today. Maybe you've seen some baptisms and some other people have faith, but you in God today, make that decision. And then let me know. Let us know at the connecting center, the prayer team over here. Uh, You can text the word. Our team's going to follow up with you. Baptism, again, is that the next step for you? You know Jesus, but there's probably a lot of people in this room who haven't been baptized yet. Take that next step. What else? Is it serving? What area for you? Is it getting connected in the life group? Maybe it's something that's not up here. It's just not up here. But you know what God's leading you to do. Would you say yes to that step today? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for how you communicate to us. Thank you how you empower us. And God, we want to take the next steps of faith together. That could be apologizing to somebody. That could be coming back to you with all of our heart. It could be loving our neighbors. It could be sharing our faith this week. It could be finding someone to mentor. God, you empower us for our good and for your glory. We thank you for each person that's deciding today to follow you, Jesus. Baptisms, we thank you for each decision today. Jesus, our eyes are on you, and we pray in your name. Amen, amen.